was writing my book, my editor said, you should put this cold therapy in and saunas. And I, I rolled my eyes. I wanted to write a really scientifically based book. But I looked into it anyway and actually found that there was decent scientific evidence that both of these approaches could work. Um, in saunas, because the saunas have been around since pre-Roman times, there's, a, a, there's more evidence that they're good for you. Uh, there are Finnish studies in, from Finland looking mostly at men um, for whatever reason. So the Finnish typically sauna bathe, as they call it, a few times a week, they have them at home. And it's very clear that the more times you go in the sauna per week, the less cardiovascular disease and heart attacks you have as a, as a man. I don't know about women, but pro probably the same. And so that I think that raising the core body temp, well, not core, but the surface and lung temperature of your body may induce hormesis. We know heat shock proteins that come on with heat can extend lifespan of animals. So that makes sense. And on the cold side, we don't know as much about that. It's, it's more recent, but uh, we do know that cold does induce what's called brown fat, which we have on our shoulders and back, only discovered 15 years ago to exist in adults. Babies have it because they don't shiver. They actually use their brown fat to stay warm. And brown fat is very healthy metabolically. Um, it burns energy. It's got lots of mitochondria. And it's thought that the brown fat secretes little molecules in the bloodstream that's helping the rest of the body. So there is some evidence that being cold and shocking your body that way is also inducing hormesis. Um, there's a sirtuin called sirtuin number three, sirt three, and that one is induced dramatically in levels by cold. Uh, and so, again, just more evidence that putting your body in adverse conditions the way we used to live before we had air conditioning and heating uh, can really be beneficial. Sirtuins are, uh, they remove acetyl groups. Used to be just from histones, but it turns out it's from all proteins. And by removing acetyl groups, it turns proteins on. And we know of a minimum of 84 different mitochondrial proteins that get activated with sirtuin-3. And it has complex interactions with P PGC1 alpha and the AMP kinase system. But in general, if you don't turn on your sirtuins, you're losing at least 10% of your mitochondrial function, if not more. Um, and your sirtuins, your sirtuin-3 especially is the only one that's truly associated or known to be associated with uh, increasing longevity if you activate it. So that's important. We also know it starts to decline in your 30s and it's abysmally low by the time you are 60, which means that all of your tissues that require a lot of energy are failing. So your liver, your brain, your heart, and your muscle are especially problematic, right? So if you activate your sirtuins, this is the master regulator. This is the first step. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's probably about seven or eight known uh, natural sirtuin three activators, but a lot of them have only been studied in cell systems. And the only big three that we've known that are in mammal systems are Hinochial, uh, which come from Magnolia. Um, my second favorite is something called dihydromoricetin. Um, and this one's actually incredibly interesting because someone noticed that it improved liver health. Right. And someone else noticed that if you're hung over and you take this stuff, you do better. So it's actually marketed for hangover mornings. And the reason that works is because if you're an alcoholic or if you drink a lot, you're killing your mitochondria in your liver. And by turning on the mitochondria in your liver, you're going to recover faster. So I felt kind of dumb ordering stuff for liver failure for my alcoholic problem, which I don't have, but I take it now daily because I think it's incredibly useful. Um, but the third one that's really shocking that really helps with uh, SIR2 and 3 is melatonin, um, which actually is really interesting because it's been, it's, it's evolved with your mitochondria for like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And it's been demonstrated that it too activates SIR2 and 3 in quite a very substantial way. So those are my top three, right? Um, one or all of them, you know, take your pick. One's probably fine. Um, the other problem with sirtuins, of course, is we know that they require NAD as a cofactor. It's a coenzyme, right? So if you are not on NAD, your, your, uh, sirtuin activation just isn't going to work. So item two in saving your mitochondria has to be some sort of NAD precursor. That's number two, right? Mm -hmm. And then the question is what comes next in saving your mitochondria? And this is a toss up. Um, 
You want to activate your NRF2 system, which turns on all of your antioxidants. You want to block the opening of your mitochondrial transition pore. Uh, there are just many, many, many things that you could possibly substitute in for number three. Um, but because it's my absolute favorite nutrient, I'm going to throw in astaxanthin because it is the best free radical scavenger that there is. Uh, and it also uh, increases your endogenous antioxidants, your catalase, et cetera. So I would have to go with uh, those three as my top choices.